has been my calling. Gotcha. You know, I like to lead for any number of reasons. I, mean, I find it a, a very creative outlet for me. And how we work with people, how we resolve a problem, or how we, you know, make an advancement. That's a very creative process. It's also a kind of a mental struggle, right? And so, what is your definition of equity when, when we walk through life? Well, I think that it has changed a little bit over time. And <clears throat> I, I will tell you that I think it's built around three different ideas. Equity, I think, for, for myself, for all the kids, for my staff, is about, first of all, it's connected to having access to the same opportunities that everyone else has. Without, without conditions, okay? That is, I mean, I can take AP class if I take all these other, uh, without gatekeeping going on, because other people don't have to suffer through that. It's also built around what I would say a sense of fairness or social justice. It, it seems like it, it's fair that people should have the same opportunity, that we shouldn't have obstacles because of our color, because of the language which we speak, or our cultural practices that, you know, that serves as a gate, gatekeeper. That makes no sense. It doesn't. The third part is around what I call inclusion. People need to be included. They need to be accepted. Beyond that, they need to be respected. And you know, given their talents that we know are there, they ought to be appreciated. That's my broad uh, approach to equity. Well, I'm very excited today because I feel that I'm talking with a legend, <laughs> Dr. Ron Cabrera. Thank you so much for making time to be in here today with me and uh, with the audience. Um, hopefully we can record a pretty meaningful and uh, wise episode. Well, thank you, Nestor. It's my pleasure, my honor. I hope we have a great uh, conversation. I, I am actually very optimistic that uh, we'll have a great conversation. I hope it has value. Yes, of course. I am sure we will. Um, we just came from last weekend where we had the Four Corners Leadership uh, Conference where uh, it was very productive and inspiring for me to learn about all the other Latino leaders, their stories, their expertise. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Actually, I think it was Don Rangel. Yes. He, he said something about you that I was like, damn, this is awesome. I would love to hear more about this. He said that you're one of the busiest retired leaders he's ever <laughs> met. <laughs> that you're always on to something. You're always doing something, always staying busy. And I wanted to start just by asking you, how are these days going for you? How, what's keeping you busy? What's keeping you going? You know, since I uh, retired ostensibly, so I retired in 2017. I had been the assistant superintendent of instructional services and equity in the Boulder Valley School District. And, you know, you retire and you kind of wonder what you're going to do, though Though I was also at the same time doing some executive coaching, which I really love, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But it's it's a matter of kind of serendipity that some things surfaced my way, and that started me being involved in, in continuing my, yeah, my 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 love and my interest and my passion in the field of education. What's better about it now is I get to target that. I get a target in areas specifically that I think I, I, can, I can make a difference. Things around diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, areas of talent development. Because I know that, you know, my star, is long, my star has long faded. But I have an opportunity to get, get folks who are, I think have talent. They need visibility. They need to be at a place where they can be influenced. So that has been the nature of my work. And with good fortune, you know, I've been kind of connected to different things that One has, like, serendipitously led to another. And you know some of this for me, uh, but I will just for the purpose of sharing. So I went from being um, entirely retired for about a month, uh, getting a phone call to do some interim positions. Now, at first I thought, well, that's good. Beginnings and endings. So I was the interim chief of family and community ed uh, education in the Denver Public Schools. Uh, Superintendent Tom Bosberg asked me if I'd come in, and which I did. And actually, that lasted all of a month. I thought, well, okay, I can do that. I got to see people I, I knew. I got to kind of meet new people. And it was exciting to me because it was like a new adventure. 
It was you know out of my field of what I'd been doing regularly. And then and shortly thereafter, he asked me if I'd be the associate chief, the interim associate chief of academics and innovation. I think it's labeled something else now. But it's curriculum instruction. I love the idea of learning I love the idea of effective instruction because that helps kids learn and they're curious. And it's like it helps address my own sense of curiosity. So I did that for three or four months until they brought someone on board. And they kept me on doing um, DEI or diversity, e e equity, in, um, inclusive, inclusion type of work. So I kept doing that. So that has kept me busy. But while that has happened, that has spawned some other things. Um, and so I have a number of side projects all dealing with building capacity of leaders. Mm -hmm. Leaders of color because, you know, they are not so frequent. Mm -hmm. I, I've, you know, heard it several times, you know, I've never seen anyone quite like you, you know, in all my life. I've never had a Latino principal. I remember when an electrician came into my office when I was a superintendent, and he said, you know, Dr. Cabrera, I would never thought I'd ever see a Latino superintendent in my life. You are the first one in our district. Wow. So that was exciting to me, but it's also very meaningful. Mm. I mean, it means that we have to cultivate more leaders of color so they're not such like a, like Halley's Comet once a rate every eight years or something like that, <sighs> but they're more visible than that. And our kids need those type of models. So that is what has kept me busy when Don Ronhel mentioned that. He knows that I've uh, been doing things like that, and it, it does keep me busy. And... Uh, because there's always something else being un under uh, uncovered. One last thought on that. So one other side project I do, I work with the Colorado Association of School Executives. And 13 years ago, we, you know, uh, a colleague and I, a gentleman named Dr. Frank Davila, and I <coughs> were saying, you know, we need to do more to get more leaders of color. And where do you typically get folks like assistant principals and principals? Well, we typ typically get them from our teacher ranks, mm -hmm. right, to get promoted. So we checked out the data. Now, here's the dilemma that we saw. There was a very small percentage of folks, less than 15%, that were uh, leaders, uh, principals, assistant principals of color. But there was even a smaller percentage that were teachers of color. Mm. So we started this program that is now called LEAD, Leadership, oh, Equity, so and Diversity. Oh, so what's you guys? Yeah. Wow. And we target teachers of color to introduce them to the idea, what if you were a formal leader? You know, um, and the research is pretty clear. By 85% of us, maybe yourself included, you know, we came, we came into the workforce as teachers wanting just to be a wonderful teacher. And there's value and there's, you know, uh, in that, uh, and there's a richness. How we, you know, 85% of us didn't even think about administration until someone said, you ever thought about being a principal? Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe that triggered your thought. Certainly that triggered mine. My principal asked me that question. And I was at North High School here in Denver, and I just thought, he said, I hadn't thought about it, but all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe that's a possibility. What were you doing at North High School when you were asked that yeah. question? I was an English teacher, and I was the track and cross country coach. Mm. The other compliment he gave me, he said, I like the way you organize kids. You know, we recruited a lot of kids. And athletics at North High School at the time was not very successful, except for the track and cross country team, <laughs> which I was coaching. <laughs> nice. But you were, I think you showed me a picture of you on a newspaper as a college athlete. Is that correct? Or I'm remembering wrong. Well, I, I wasn't. Well, I was a college athlete, but I actually, I was ski raced at the University of Colorado, but but I was, you know, got into running. Probably was a better runner than I was a ski racer. Okay. And, and so I've run a lot of you know, citizen races and um, got the kids I worked with, you know. Many of them were talented. And so some of them were able to continue that into college. And so my ability at that time to run with them, have fun with them, encourage them, um, I think helped them along the way. And they, they grew as athletes. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I... Um, I am just very curious to see your origins. Uh, where, where were you born, your parents? What kind of role models you had growing up yeah. that took you to this amazing leadership, uh, successful career that you have had? Well, my parents were, were immigrants, immigrant families from Mexico. They came shortly after the Mexican Revolution in 1910. 
1917s, 18s, you know, late teens into the early 20s. Um, they came from, uh, my father's side of the family came from the state of Sinaloa. Sinaloa. And my mother's side came from the state of Puebla and into California. My, my parents, my father's side of the family came up, you know, up to the, 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 what we call the Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, and all the towns in there, and landed in a small area there that was called Antioch. Very, you could say, segregated immigrants largely. They worked uh, things like the, 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 the canneries for fishing and this type of thing. Mm-hmm. And my, my abuelito there did you know, manual labor types of things. And they had six siblings, which included my pe- my dad. Okay. okay. I'll get back to that story in just a second. My mother's side of the family ended up in the Fresno area, which is very agricultural, the Central Valley, as we call it. And so they did things in the fields, packing houses to pack the fruit. Uh, my mother worked the fields when she was growing up as a youngster, uh, those types of things. And so, um, so those are kind of the roots. So here's what I got out of that. Clearly, uh, the willingness to do hard work, persistence, and certainly a desire to improve our lot. And I, I would say my father was the real visionary around that. And my mother was the one who demonstrated persistence and, and focus. So my father was kind of the really kind of very creative side. He had a lot of big ideas. And my mother had to kind of keep him organized, <laughs> you know, so he could do it. But certainly from my father's side of the family, there was a clear message about how important education was. My abuelito had a sixth grade education in Mexico. My abuelita on that side of the family had a second grade education. But it was really stressed. Uh, and music as well. Okay. So those kind of the arts part and the academic part. So all my aunts and uncles on that side of the family were very, uh, very studious, good students. Um, they all were musical. You know, my father used to play violin. And when I was in grade school I played trumpet he would play duets with me and I thought he sounded horrible (laughs) and then later before he passed away he lived with us for a couple years and he was playing like a couple hours a day actually he was very good as a violin (laughs) as I didn't discover he just didn't had hadn't had time to practice you know but in any case but here's the here are the role models all my aunts and uncles actually got a college degree save except for the oldest who was my godfather and there's all sorts of health reasons why that didn't happen but he was actually extremely bright very musical and talented, and kind of entrepreneurial. So my, I had an uncle who became a dentist. Um, my father became a, a university professor. Uh, he was he very academic. Uh, an, an aunt who was really involved, got her master's degree, but she was involved with uh, social work and activism in California with Cesar Chavez, so worked nice. with Cesar Chavez. Wow. Yeah, okay. and, and so um, I had a... An, an uncle who actually was trilingual. He learned French. He got shot down in World War II in France and picked up French. You know, he was able to escape from you know, to the French underground. And so he became a professor or instructor at community college in, 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 in California. So all these folks had these roots about you know, the importance of education. You need it for opportunity. That was one. Secondly, you need it for Social mobility. Elevate yourself from where you are. I think that was an important message for all my aunts and uncles. My father, I certainly got that from my father. Um, My parents, my mother actually never got a college degree. She did get an associate's degree, but I was already like in third or fourth grade when she finished that up. Mm. But um, they were my role models, and my dad was an inspiration to me. Um, he wrote several books. Uh, he really advocated for what he thought was right. Um, you, you would say that certainly on my father's side of the family, much more politically oriented. Okay. So, you know, I'm a child of the 60s. Mm. Civil rights movement. Yeah. Segregation. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the Black Panthers were formed when I was in junior high. And they weren't that far away. Yeah. And, and so I was living in a group in San Jose. Mm. <coughs> we had moved there. And so um, those are the types of things, social justice, you know, kind of formed in my eyes. So how you 
manifest that comes across different ways. You know, my aunt was like very kind of you say a real activist, Wegla and and the farm workers, this type of thing. Um, my father was like much more political, working in the system. You know, uh, so uh, in fact, he ran for politics. He ran uh, for an office in California. He did not didn't get it. He was runner up in the Democratic primary, and that was like his his like first and only attempt to do that that sort of organized way. My mother wasn't that keen about it, so I think that probably dis discouraged, discouraged him. him. But, you know, you pick up on these things. And so they kind of um, formed a part of my core values. My father was an avid reader. And I will tell you, I don't think I was a very strong reader through the early part of my primary educational career. Growing up. Mm -hmm. And so... This is how we approached it, you know. Um, my father would take me to Goodwill stores, okay. thrifty stores, right? And he'd pick up half a dozen books, you know, simple little chill kids' books, you know, mm -hmm. Cowboys and Indians, different adventure stories. It cost five or ten cents at the time, and he would, you know, say, hey, "Why don't you read them, Ron?" I'd read them, and he'd ask me questions, you know. So tell me about the story. I, that is actually how I became a better reader. Huh. So by the time I got in fifth and sixth grade, I was at grade level maybe exceeded it. That's awesome. So, you know, you and I would say that was probably a very whole language approach. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you keep your Spanish? Because your, your Spanish, I remember, I've, I've heard you speaking Spanish all over the place, no problem. Incluso conmigo en alguna de nuestras a veces, sí, conversaciones. But, but, you know, I will tell you, and this is probably one, my one regret. So, obviously, Spanish was the first language of my parents. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, over time, they had to learn English, and so they were bilingual. We had, we had Spanish and English at home, though primarily, my English is my first language. Okay. Okay. So there were times there'd be some Spanish going on. And actually, I, oh, when I was very young, my father got a job with the government, U.S. government, education, and we, and we moved to Bolivia. And we helped them develop elementary, the elementary uh, schools, las escuelas elementarios. Okay. And, and so... You know, that's where I became fluent in Spanish. But then you come back in the States, you know. And I was very young. Bueno, sí. and, and so, you know, I have those roots, linguistic roots. So now we go with my, all oh, my aunts and uncles. We meet with my abuelita. She was like the matriarch of the family in the Bay Area on my dad's side. All my cousins, you know. And obviously the conversations in Spanish among the adults. All the kids are playing. We're all talking in English. They talk to us in Spanish. We respond in English. Uh-huh. You know. Typical. Very classical, right? Typical. Mm -hmm. Very typical. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm fluent in Spanish. Okay. I wish I were. I do have one more story about that. So I, I took Spanish in junior high and then in, in, in high school. And I wouldn't say I ever kind of, it was not a difficult subject. On the other hand, I was never fluent. I get into college. I'm an English major. Now I get into studying my junior and my senior year comparative lit. Okay. Right. Latin American uh, texts compared with English texts. I loved it. And so I want to start reading things, you know, in Spanish. So one day I say to my father, and he's a professor at the University of Colorado, I say to him, you know, Dad, if I don't take these two courses, I won't graduate. But I could go to Mexico and really study up my language and read more things and in Spanish, and thinking that he would say, what a wonderful idea. You're going to get the roots of your language back, your culture. Uh-oh. But, you know, he knew how much work it would He said, oh, no, you won't. <laughs> 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 You'll be just another guy without that piece of paper. <laughs> college graduate. Oh, for him, that was important. In our society, college graduate is, be, is important. It's a big deal. It's a standard. It's a, it's a currency in our society saying, oh, you're educated. Mm-hmm. He, did, he wanted to prevent me from you know, not having that. So he said, you can do that later. You get out of college. Well, I got married out of college. <laughs> that changes all the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. That changes the whole trajectory of life, right? So I get pick up my Spanish. I hang out with people like you, Nestor. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. uh, Man, that's awesome. That's phenomenal. So your dad... Uh, was a professor here in the University of Colorado, but you grew up in California. Yes. What, so what, what happened was, <coughs> what happened was, is that I was like, 
he grew up in California too as a child. Then as an adult, he and he was an educator. He got public schools. He was a high school teacher, elementary teacher. Then he became an elementary principal. And and he had you know and and I, I don't want to make a big deal about this. He he and actually my uncles and aunts went to Berkeley. Okay. They say, oh, getting to Berkeley now is really hard. But he, you know, so my uncle once said. You know, after World War II, the GI Bill, you, you go, you can get into Berkeley. It was really easy, and it wasn't that expensive, right? So, gotcha. So my dad wanted to get a doctorate. He knew that was a currency he needed to advance in his career. And so he was a very practical and pragmatic man. And he looked at all these different doctoral programs. The one that was the fastest was the University of Colorado. Okay. <laughs> So during my second grade year, we moved to Colorado. Oh, as a kiddo, as eight a kid. years old, seven, eight years, seven, old. eight years old. So my and my my father quit his job, my mother quit her job. I mean, their job was to get through all the coursework. So my brother and I, you know, so I went to a school in, in Boulder it's called Lincoln Elementary School. It's now called the Aropi University. This old building, mm. and my you know, and my brother went to uh, um, same elementary school, and. You know, we were kind of left unattended. You know, we'd run around campus. You know, we'd play in whatever dumpsters that were there. My father's full-time job was to be a student. Well, I'm really proud of him. And so one of the high marks in my life is that, you know, after like 14, 15 months, he, he, he earned his doctorate. Wow. You know, so when he is very mission-driven, he was really after it. And he, I, and what I picked up for this, my dad was so focused. My mother was like number one assistant. And so you may say they neglected the children, didn't feel that way, but to get this work done. So here's the story I want to share with you. Because the story I think we all need to replicate. Something along these lines. So we go to graduation. It's the spring of my second grade year. You know, I finished up second grade. <coughs> and... Um, my dad goes across in the, where I forget where they were, they had the graduation ceremony, receives his diploma, his doctorate degree, and my mother turns to my brother and me and says, boys, from now on, when you, when you introduce your father to your, to your friends, he's Dr. Cabrera. Oh. And I, I mean, even now, I can't quite say it right, but just because it really emotionally affects me because it, wow. At that moment, I said, Nestor, I'm going to be a doctor. Wow. You see, there was, uh, at, at that time, that meant something. This was in the early 60s. But how many people of color had a doctorate degree? You know, a handful, right? So that meant something. I didn't know all that it meant, but I, I knew I wanted to get it. So, okay. So that was a meaningful experience. It gave me something to aspire for. And I think for, to bring it back to what we do in our lives, Nestor, when you work with kids, when I work with kids, or I get to work with adults who have influence with kids, we want to give them meaningful targets that gives them richness and value in their life. That's what we do as leaders. Because then that gives a real sense of purpose to our work. So, um, yeah. So he was a professor. So that was in California. So, well, he got a degree in Boulder, but he immediately had followed up and got a job in San Jose. Oh, okay. So he had to go back. Went back to so yeah. and, and so he was a professor at what was then San Jose State College. So I grew up in San Jose from third grade to the end of my sophomore year. Uh. Okay. At which point, the University of Colorado recruited my father. He came to CU Boulder in the School of Education. That's how we got to Colorado. So I came to call I usually say I came to Colorado when I was a junior in high school got it but okay but yep. the the detail there is that you were here for about a year yes that's right a year and a half yeah. and then you went to college you got your degree mm -hmm. uh, this uh, principal in North High School saw you as an English teacher but saw your potential for leadership yeah. when did you get your first leadership job what was it okay well that's a really good question I, I, I guess I say unofficially I'd gotten my um, I was working on my doctorate. I'd finished all my coursework, but I came back, right? And so, and during the time I was doing it, I got my administrative license. So I thought, you know, I really didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. 
because even in my head, I wasn't quite ready to step into administration. And partly that's, and I will say again, based on all my experiences, because there wasn't someone there like immediately saying, Ron, you have your license. Let's do something with it. Uh-huh. So I was cautious. And too many teachers of color are cautious because they don't think they're quite ready. Right? We call it now imposter <coughs> syndrome. Right? Yep. But out of the blue, I, I kind of wrote to the, who was then the assistant superintendent for elementary. In DPS or? DPS. In DPS, okay. I just said, you know, I want to meet, you know, can we have a chance to meet? I just got my license. I'd like to visit with you. I did that kind of impulsively. So sometimes we take it just in your own creative way, right? Got no response. Remember, this was before email. I wrote, actually wrote a letter. And so I called her up and said, you know, I, I sent you a letter. I <coughs> didn't hear from you. She goes, letter? You sent a, uh, who knows? Maybe I put the wrong address. But she goes, I'll meet with you. So she met me with me at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning at North High School. Woo. I was a student activities director. My principal had made me a student activities director. Uh, and I thought it was going to be like a get-to-know-you meeting. Okay. It turned out to be an interview. What? So, yeah. You were not prepared for that. I was that. not prepared for this. This was like <clears throat> December. So she said, at the end of our conversation, it was an hour, she said, Ron, we have a position at Centennial Elementary School. It's a teacher's assistant to the principal. So, teacher on special assignment. Teacher's assistant to the principal. You know, and you might want to try that out just to you know, see if you like elementary. Let me know by 5 o'clock. So I had that same day. That okay. same day. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I went to talk to my principal, who was like one of my mentors, and said, you won't believe this. I'm like, and this gentleman's name was Lino Gonzalez. So I said, Lino, you know, um, the, the, the assistant superintendent just told, asked me about this. He goes, yeah, go for it. And he encouraged me. So I did. So that's how I got into elementary. So I did it for one semester. That position became an assistant principal position, which I had to apply for. And I got interviewed. I got selected. So that was my first official position. entry to the leadership. Yep. Before that, when do you know, was that a moment where you were like, okay, I just had this realization that school leadership is my calling in life. Was, that, was, was there a moment where that happened or, at some, or, or you just gradually you started warming up into what yeah. you would later become? You know, uh, that's a very good question, Astor, because I'm not sure I warmed up to the idea of school leadership. Mm. is my calling. <coughs> I do think that leadership has been my calling. Gotcha. You know, I like to lead for any number of reasons. I, mean, I find it a, a very creative outlet for me. How we work with people, how we resolve a problem, or how we you know, make an advancement. That's a very creative process. It's also a kind of a mental struggle. right? And so think about this when you were, on, when you were young boy, Nestor, when you're playing games, you know, where did you, you know, wh- what was your role, you know? Um, I'm going to make an assumption. I grew up in Venezuela, no? I did. Mm-hmm. And when, I, I, I bet you played football there, right? A lot. lot. <coughs> and when you played, what position did you play? I used to be forward or uh, uh, left central. Okay. So you had access to the ball a lot, yeah. right? A lot of shots on goal. Uh-huh. Those were people who were skilled take charge, right? I know a little bit about football or soccer that could be dangerous, just so you know. My oh. kids played it, but... Oh, nice. Okay. So I was growing up, you know, and we'd play touch football in the neighborhood. I always wanted to be the quarterback. <laughs> now, I'm not very big, you know that. <laughs> I don't have the greatest arm, but, but we usually won. Nice. Okay, so uh, I, it's just, just, just to say as an example, I like to be in places where I have some control of the outcome. Maybe that's the better way of saying it. I get to be creative that way. And I am competitive, but that's not the real outlet. I like bringing things to completion. Mm -hmm. I like, and it's really fun when you have other people joining you. I mean, that's why teams are so great. Mm -hmm. We have a common mission, a common focus, and when we accomplish it, it's like it's a big celebration. Mm -hmm. That's why I like coaching. Obviously, I'm not running any of the races mm-hmm. when I was coaching at North High School, but we became very successful. We won districts a couple times, and they hadn't won any for you know, decades. You know, I had several kids who were all state runners. 
you know, they found success. That's it awesome. made me so happy to see them successful. Yeah, like seeing others succeed. Yeah. Um, I love what you said, that leadership, you see leadership as a very creative process, as a very creative outlet. It, my brain went straight, went straight to uh, leadership as a fun, playful, almost uh, didactic endeavor where you always have to grapple with difficult things and you have to create an outcome and be in control of it. Yeah. That's beautiful. I didn't think of leadership in those words. It also made me wonder, and I'm really excited about asking you this question, okay. is what do you think in all your years of experience, what do you think the, the key attributes of a great leader are uh, in this day and age? That's a really challenging question, but I've thought about it a lot. And I think it's evolved over time. I do think that our most effective leaders are very clear about their own sense of values, both personal and and professional. Sometimes they're intermingled. Okay. I told you how I, what I grew up with in terms of what my parents perceived that was important in society and fairness. And, and we grew up in the age of, of, of integration, social you know, change. So what am I, that's, a, that's a personal value of mine also. But it's also a professional value. I call it moral purpose. Moral purpose. Moral purpose. <coughs> we need to have a sense of moral purpose. I mean, I think we're all trying to do, I'll put this in quotation marks, the right things. But mine is always trying to say, the right thing is, is how do we advance the underserved? The kids that used to be like little Ryan Cabrera, you know, and, uh, the little Nestor Bravos, you know, of the world, you know. Uh, they deserve the same opportunity. Um, and, and so that's important. My family is really important to me. Uh, so that's a personal value. So, so that's really personalized. But professionally, I talk about the value of joy. Because in my job, you know, you got to love your job. You got to love the people you're with. And when I say love, I, I, I mean that in the sense of, you know, you want to cultivate their relationship. And you want to be able to have a, a respect for them. And being fun with each other, that's the fun part of the job. You know, as you well know, and I, not everything we do in leadership is like dead serious. Sometimes we prank each other. We have a little few laughs here and there. We can even laugh in misery sometimes when things <laughs> don't quite go our ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who would have guessed, right? Uh, and so that's the love and joy I like to have. Right? Uh, some pers- so we got, we got moral purpose. We have joy. I do think... Um, be a good listener. Listening is a, a key leadership quality that I, I think has only recently been emphasized more now. And you listen not only for understanding, but I think you listen for the realization that you don't have the answer. So that takes you to, uh, kind of slides itself into some humility. You know, there used to be a time when I thought as a leader, I, I, I'm supposed to come up with a solution. That puts a great burden on a leader who feels like they are the only solution person. So I think we've gotten smarter. So listener, and then you know, knowing that you can, with built on relationships, you can find a solution. So maybe that leads us to the idea of teamwork. Teamwork. And um, so that's an important, I think, leadership value. No personal value is what I call the love of learning. Let me put it this way. At a leader perspective, you and I know we have to be the lead learner of our organizations, of our school, that's an organization, of our, or any, in our departments, or if you're superintendent of, your, of, this, of the district. Can't be afraid to learn. And I hope we're curious, because we owe that to our children who are curious when they come in. 100%. So, that's an important aspect. And then I have just two more that I think are professional qualities. I think one is, obviously, I think we need to have a sense of mission and vision because that's going to drive you where you want to take a district. And, and as much as you always say, you have to follow the district that's been created by many people. As a, as a leader, you get to color it some. And that's shaped by what you, you know, people will listen to what you think is, is 
right and reasonable. And if they can adopt it, then you, you're meeting to you're meeting to ends. One is like I can personally commit to myself, and the district certainly has a path to follow. The last part is called compassion. I, I think we have to recognize that the road to success is not easy for everyone, either for our children, or for our teachers, or our leadership colleagues. And if the things don't go right, I think. Uh, Rather than penalize them, we've got to think about how can we help them? What's the right support? I'm a believer that no one's trying to do the wrong thing. You can take missteps. I've certainly had some missteps along the way. Um, <clears throat> but I want to have folks be able to say, in my case, all right, I understood what he was trying to do. He's not a bad person. Now, let's get him back on his feet. And I've been fortunate enough for folks who have kind of let me do that. Uh, and so I think those are key qualities. Here's what you didn't hear. You didn't hear data driven. You did not. You did not. <laughs> and now data is important. If I'm a learner, I need some data, right? Of course. So I haven't. So I'm not neglecting it, but that's not the first thing I go to. You know, I want to kind of know what the big picture is, and I need to kind of understand all the things that influence it. That's my learning. That's phenomenal. I've. Um, it, it makes me think to to another attribute of leadership, but I want to make a little parenthesis just to. Just to share with everybody listening that when I met you was about, I think, three or four years ago yes. when you were my executive coach. I was in my probably second year, the first second year as a principal, still trying to figure so many things out. I, I loved my conversations with you. I will look forward to it. It was like a little oasis in, <laughs> in the middle of such hard days. But I remember during that time, we had to stop the executive coaching because you were called to become the interim superintendent. <clears throat> That's correct. And yes. I was so proud of you. I was like, yeah, he's my coach. <laughs> <laughs> he's my coach. He's going to be the interim superintendent. And obviously, of course, you had to stop that relationship we had. And I'm bringing this little parenthesis because I wanted to ask you, in all your years of service as a leader, where have been the moments where you have been the most challenged to exercise all these values? I'm bringing this up because when you were called to be the interim superintendent, from Denver Public Schools, it was not an easy walk in the park because there was the DCTA negotiations. There was a lot of things going on. And you knew that you accepted the job knowing that it was going to be a temporary uh, assignment. It took a little bit longer, but not knowing much about your leadership journey, I would guess that that time was probably one of the most challenges. But I don't know. I just wanted to ask you if there have been any other times where you have been that challenged. Well, that was a, a very challenging time, and probably <clears throat> the other most challenging time, and they're very similar, was when it was my first superintendency. Mm. It was during the time when we had the recession in 2008, during that time, and there was a lot of budget cuts, right? <clears throat> how, do you, how do you love your people and say, but I can't afford to have all your people, mm. all of you here? I mean, that seems like I'm talking at both sides of my mouth. Similarly, when... I became the interim superintendent. There was negotiations going on with the DCTA. And obviously, they said, their argument was, you know, we need to be compensated enough to say that we're valued, as valued as any other teacher in the Denver metro area. And I didn't dis disagree with that. I don't think there was anyone who disagreed. The challenge was, you know, how do you find that type of financial support mm -hmm. to make that happen? So I, you know, I, as I thought about it, so let's think about that particular circumstance. So I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. You might recall that what they wanted for an increase would require like $25 million of new money. And of course, school finance wasn't going to give us $25 million in new money. As a matter of fact, the best calculation was going to be like 8 or $9 million, maybe maybe ten. <coughs> And so, you know, when you offer some money and say, well, here, let me just pump things up like with $5 million. That's like, I'm just poking the bear. You know, they're just angry. Like, you're insulting us. You know, you think that's going to get us anywhere what we need. So I had to think about what we'd have to do. And I'm the interim. But I, came, I did come up with an idea, which I had to explore with both the Board of Education and the senior staff. So I, I walked around the administration building and there are a lot of people there. Uh, there are a lot of people there, all right? And, but, you know, and, I, and I will just say, just because I had, took the time 
to walk around and say, no one's like, you know, twiddling their thumbs, doing word searches, crossword puzzles. I mean, they're all doing something that's, you know, is important. But I, I had to do some comparisons. And here's the data part in my learning. While we were contemplating negotiations, Nestor, the Los Angeles Unified School District was doing the same thing. Right? They were like three or four weeks in advance of us, right? They're at the district with 400,000 kids. I don't mm. know if that's accurate. Large, you know, one, of the, one of the largest districts in the country. And so I was doing some comparisons, and we're, you know, we're talking to their communications department, how their negotiations were going, just so we could learn something. And so I discovered that they had like 12 people in the communications department. Just 12? Just 12. District 400,000 kids. We had 36. So I had to ask myself, okay, what's wrong with this picture? Right? Something just didn't seem right because we were actually like one fourth the size and we had almost three times the size of communications. So, not just to bang on that. Then I walked around and I saw, well, we had like 48 workstations in our um, school data research department. I forget what the title is right now, but 48. And I, you know, I um, had just come from a district that had. 30,000 kids, one-third the size of DPS, and we had three. Mm. So I said, do we need that much horsepower, right? Um, so I talked to the staff about the notion of, of um, okay, what's the term? It's the law of di diminishing return. That is, you can build up to a certain point to you reach a peak, and then after, you keep adding to it, but actually you get very little, or actually performance goes down. Gotcha. Okay. So I said, so what if instead of what we're doing, well, it's called 100%, we reduce that to 90%. What would that look like for the Denver Public Schools? It's kind of a rhetorical question because I said, I think it looked pretty damn good. So I talked to my CFO, some other comparisons. Most school districts spend between 80 to 85% of the general fund on personnel. I had just come from a district that was like considered one of the highest paid districts in the state. We paid 91% of our general fund was for personnel. You know, so there's trade-offs, right? I paid big salaries. I have less discretionary fund due to other projects, but you know, the trade-off was employee peace, right? Labor workforce peace. So I said to my CFO at the time, I said, what's how much do we invest into personnel? He said, about 80%. 80%. I came from district where I was investing 90. So I said, all right, what would it take? Then I did another calculation. I said, all right, what's the average salary of a person in the central office? I said, I'm guessing about $100,000. He said, yeah, that's about right. With benefits, another like 22, 24,000, about 124,000. So I said, all right, you want... We need twenty. We need fifteen million dollars, mm -hmm. but we need about one hundred fifty positions. So that's the simple solution, right? Now, here's the hard part. Someone's got to cut those positions, right? Mm -hmm. I have to come to you and say, Nestor, mm -hmm. you're doing. You work hard, but like your talent, but we are downsizing this department. You know, you notice it wasn't like all the departments need to cut back by you know five percent. Could have done it that way, but that actually wasn't equitable. Mm. You, know, you, you overcompensated in a couple of different departments. So that was the starting point. Obviously, there's other things that could have happened. Now, the only good news for me was, Mr. was that I came up with a plan. I shared it with the next superintendent, Susanna. And she's the one who executed it. <laughs> so she didn't feel great about Ooh. it. But we had been really smart because it was challenging. Anyone who goes through negotiations, be a participant, it's usually not that much fun. People like change their personality. They're, mm -hmm. they're mean spirited. They're rude. Um, I say combative. Combative, yes. So um, if we had offered this early, earlier, and we could have said, "Well, all right, you want this much money? You got it." That would have removed all those political arguments. Like, well, we're not treated with respect. We're not compensated. So all those things that you know kind of carried all the way to the end, unfortunately, that Susanna had to deal with. You know, we could have eliminated some of that and undercut some of the political piece 
that was part of negotiations. Mm -hmm. It was the right move. You know, we have all this organizational creep that occurs over time, and that's an experience. But that was really a challenging time. It was a challenging time knowing that I was supposed to be the bridge between the outgoing superintendent, Tom Bosberg, different style than mine, and Susana Cordova, who I really respect, and just kind of keep things together. But, you know, in those circumstances, you cannot just mark time. Yeah. Right? Uh, the one other thing I had to do or that I, I did, I, I, I talked to all my ISs. Okay. Okay. I believe good, mm. effective leaders are focused on their work. All organizations are notorious for trying to do more things than they ought to. And at the ground level, people said, we're really fragmented. We don't know mm. what we're doing. Right? Mm -hmm. So I said to them, at least for the next 100 days, I want you to focus on three things. Other things, you know, just don't need as much attention. To bring a little coherence to the work that we do, and maybe that'll be a window of opportunity. Now, I don't know to how, how effective that was, I mean, how many people really did that, but that would be an approach to help sh you know, move the organization in a place where it could get stabilized. And so that was my attempt during that time. Wow, very, very challenging. Um, yeah, I do remember I was watching the negotiations through Vmail, I think the, the digital platform and yeah, they were tense. <coughs> yeah. And uh, morally everybody was in an agreement that yeah, teachers deserve to be paid more. Who's going to say no? Who's going to be against that? Yeah. The problem is like you said, where are we going to get the money from it? I want to rescue the the uh, insight you gave when you were looking at all departments and you said one option was to get uh, the equivalent amount of money out of all the departments, but it was not equitable just because of the needs of the district. Yeah. It sounds like in that critical mo moment, equity was definitely a value of yours. Like yes. you wanted to make sure that whatever you were suggesting to move and change was not compromising that core value of equity. What do you think now that you look back and at your own story, what is your definition of equity? when we walk through life? Well, I think that it has changed a little bit over time. And <clears throat> I, I will tell you that I think it's built around three different ideas. Equity, I think, for, for myself, for all the kids, for my staff, is about, first of all, it's connected to having access to the same opportunities that everyone else has. Without, without conditions. Okay, That is, I mean... I can take AP class if I take all these other, uh, without gatekeeping going on, because other people don't have to suffer through that. It's also built around what I would say a sense of fairness or social justice. It, it seems like it, it's fair that people should have the same opportunity, that we shouldn't have obstacles because of our color, because of the language which we speak, or our cultural practices that, you know, that serves as a gate, gatekeeper. That makes no sense. The third part is around what I call inclusion. People need to be included. They need to be accepted. Beyond that, they need to be respected. And you know, given their talents that we know are there, they ought to be appreciated. That's my broad uh, approach to equity. Now, I've tried to do this in several organizations. Mm -hmm. Remember, I was, my last formal job, I was the assistant superintendent for equity among as well as instructional practice. And I had a, a conversation with like key players of the cabinet there. Say, you know, we are supposed to be about equity. That's my charge. Let's have a statement about equity. Well, it took us four hours to come up with two sentences. Oh, my God. <coughs> because we kept kind of going around. Because people, it requires commitment, I would agree. It requires commitment, and you have to make that commitment without thinking, well, will my larger community appreciate this? Will there be political fallout, this type of thing? You know, if you're committed, you're committed. That's the way I view it. That's it. There is a, the gap between compliance and commitment is huge. Yes. Even though you just show up to work and get paid the same, and you could have somebody who just complies with the 8 to 5 or the one who's committed and does whatever it takes. The idea of access, fairness, and inclusion, I think that's, I couldn't, I don't think I could say it better. Here at TMS, we, we deconstruct equity into three words as well. Uh, here we talk about opportunity, dignity, and love. Yeah. 
uh, looking at every child as if they are worth it. Like that dignity, that intrinsic dignity that is given to you by virtue of just being a human being. Absolutely. It doesn't matter your background, your skin color, your orientation of any kind. You are alive. You're a human being. Your life is precious. Yeah. And we're going to love you and we're going to give you as many opportunities as you deserve. But then things get on the way, right? Like uh, way. scheduling, um, advocating for resources, for budgets, for grants and things. And then at the end of the day, you start seeing that um, those were the ones with privilege race to the top and the ones without um, then continue to struggle. Well, I think that's the larger, so that's the larger challenge as effective leaders. We understand what the system currently has. And, you know, it's, it's been built over time. And, and so we have to decide how we're going to manage, either negotiate through it or create subtle changes. You know, uh, and here's another point here. You have to think about how your approach to leadership is with respect to these types of things. I know colleagues of mine, and there have been time and days where I, I would agree with them. Uh, you have to take it like throwing a rock through the window, you know, be really sharp, brutal, uh, uh, startling, right? Get people's attention. Now, that's not my typical approach. But there's times when you need that. I remember, I, I recognize that. But I think our larger approach, and this is why we need a, a, an army, a movement of other Latino leaders or leaders of color in general who understand the nuance of our kids of color, the kind of the marginalized, they've been marginalized and they've been repressed, suppressed in the system that we can begin changing the system. So some of it's policy driven. Some of it is by changing, you know, practices within a building and then growing them out in the district without, you, know, you, you can do some of these things without putting, without putting a big label on them, but they're just better. And I think that's how we begin to um, create a system that is, in fact, much more equitable. My best analogy is this, and I had this kind of debate with a colleague of mine who is much more radical than me, I would say. You know, he said, viva la raza, through the rock to the window type of approach. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I said, well, listen about this. I said, you know, sometimes it's just a stream of water that you have to kind of pour in the earth over time and keep it coming. Mm -hmm. It can be very effective. You know. There's a river that has divided the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. now, that has taken a long period of time, but it has created that big divide. And that's what we're trying to do, create the change. And I think sometimes we're better served because we can, you know, this is going to sound like I'm being sneaky, sneaky. We can infiltrate the system with people who are like-minded, and that will kind of slowly change the system without it being appearing too radical. People just began to accept it in a better way. I agree, and which is why I feel very proud and very lucky to be part of the Four Corners Leadership Academy, because it's uh, it's precisely the place where we come together and we're like-minded, and we also share our stories. So powerful those stories that I heard this weekend. But also we start to see each other, in each other. We we'll start yeah. building that identity that becomes collective. Um, as you know, I'm an immigrant. I came here 14 years ago, and grew up without my parents in foster care and the whole story. And uh, for many years, I thought my story was unique and I victimized myself. And then I started seeing similar stories with a, with, with a highlight of strength and uh, courage and passion. And I started seeing myself actually encouraged to, to keep trying, to keep you know, taking the risks. And I, mm -hmm. I really echo that idea because I love it. Um, I love the fact that if we keep going on that uh, direction, the river will actually... Uh, bring a stream of like-minded people. But at the same time, I think throwing that rock out the window is that kind of passionate way of advocating for, for what we do. Um, yeah. I get really upset. I don't know if I should or if I should not, but I learned, you know, with the war in Ukraine, $40 billion were sent over there, you know. Um, DPS is trying to manage the life of 90,000 kids with $1 billion. So as a country, we decided that sending... 40 times the amount of money to that country is more important than taking care of 90,000 lives here. Or the defense budget for the U.S. is like $1.7 trillion. So it's oh, almost yeah. 2,000 times greater than the... So when I look at systems beyond our current education you know, model, I, I really get fired up because that money that's being sent there or used here is taken out of my pocket. It's my paycheck that is being, you know, if I had the opportunity to decide or to contribute, to throw the rock at the window and say, hey, stop it. 
don't use my money for those things. I have a community, I have kids, I have families here who will actually better the future of this country if we actually pay attention to it. I become really fired up. <clears throat> so having the wisdom of somebody like you saying, well, actually the river will carve the rock. Yeah. You don't have to drill through it. So, but I think, I, I guess at the end of the day is a balance of both things. So it is, there is some balance. And, and I would say, yeah, they, they've spent a, a huge amount of money for the Ukraine. And actually, I, I would personally say I'm supportive of it. Not to say I wanted to take away from the kids in, in, in our school districts in our, in our country who need it also. But you know my, my value around of fairness and social justice. Now, I just think Ukraine is being picked on by a huge bully. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a simplistic way of doing it. Uh, you know, I'm not even comparing there's a, uh, the, there's a communist country and there's a Soviet, you know, there's a d- democratic country. It just seems like, why would someone want to do that? Yeah. Right. Why would someone, uh, similarly, why would someone want to pick on a, a school district that's, you know, that doesn't have the resources? We should be supporting it because all our kids ought to be successful. So, I mean, in some ways I view it the same way. Now, I could argue, now, here's how I think we find some money. So what would I do if I were to change the school system? I would say, what could we do in this country to narrow the charge what public schools are supposed to do? 150 years ago, I think it's probably that time now, at least 100 years ago, it really was about educating kids. And you'd say, well, that's what our charge is now. But we also provide social services, provide mental health services. We provide health, wellness. We call them athletics. Uh, and, and all those kind of begin to siphon away the resources that we could help kids to be very successful going on. Uh-huh. You know, so it's all those type of afternoon programs, before school programs. And I'm just wondering, now I'm not saying those needs aren't, you know, can't be met or shouldn't be met. I think mm-hmm. they should be. Absolutely. But I think there's probably a different organization that could manage that. Ought to have that as the <coughs> focus of their work. Gotcha. Right? <coughs> so it's, it's hard enough to have folks, to get folks to help every kid be a very successful learner, as well as being kind of a quasi-social worker and, and, and health advocate and... Psychologist. Psychologist. And nutritionist. And, that's right. Daykeeper, daycare keeper, and this type of thing. He, spiritual healer. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> So I, I, that would be something that I would really like to suggest that if we could do that. I think we'd have remarkable change in what you and I measure as outcomes for student success because then it, we would be really getting to a place where I think equity could come forward and be actually very substantial. Right? Yeah. You could argue that without having some of these supports, it would never be equitable. I'm saying I think they are needed, but maybe other agencies can be the provider of those services. Oh, man, you're onto something great with that idea. Um, I want to explore it a little bit more because I have similar thoughts mm-hmm. on the way we should focus what we do in schools. But before before that, I I'd really want to pick your brain between the connections between equity and black excellence. Oh, yes. Do you see any... When you think of black excellence, do you think of that as a terminology or as a vision or as a focus within the big ball of equity, or you see equity and black excellence separately? I actually see them together. I, I think that the approach to doing black excellence is just a, a leverage point to try to get into more equitable practices. Mm. Think about it for just a second. <clears throat> Folks who advocate we need to have a specific plan for black excellence for particular our, our, our African-American kids. I'd say, you know, what they're really asking for is that what are we going to do different in terms of relationships? How are we going to connect better with our kids who come from that background? How are we going to shape instruction so they connect better so the kids are engaged in their learning? Mm. Uh, how do we make learning relevant to them? Well, won't that be true for every child that we want to have? First of all, all children in general, but all those kids who have been part of the traditional school system, mm-hmm. we need all that same sort of thing. Mm-hmm. The kids who are multilingual learners, the kids who come from different cultural or ethnic type backgrounds, 
even those kids who are second or third generation who are quasi assimilated but never 100% in this in the system need things that what we might use as strategies for black excellence would be part of the equity uh, equation i believe you know so if we're asking kid or teachers to be facile in their instructional approach in their their their, their lessons so it taps into many different kids and kind of connects with them and that's the black excellence plan it's also an equitable, good, culturally responsive instruction, I would argue, also. 100%. And also, <clears throat> when we talk about black excellence, to me, seems to also address the historical trajectory of our African-American brothers and sisters in this country and to acknowledge the past that they, they had to endure in order to be in the present with us. Uh, when we talk about black excellence, I always, when I think of black excellence, I think of a term that is charged with a lot of historical value. And That's true. It's an idea of, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to, to internalize it in a way that is as meaningful for me, not being a black person or not being an African-American person that might have in my DNA the, the history and the past that I'm carrying forward, but... The idea of black excellence as something that seeks to improve or to show that we can do better than what we have been doing historically for this particular community. What I find interesting, though, is that some white people or some Latinos mm -hmm. feel that they should not talk about it because they're not black and they did not live the experiences. And I respect that, obviously, because some people feel like, hey, I grew up in privilege I don't have the right to speak about what black excellence is. I would rather have the black people tell me what they think it is. But sometimes I kind of disagree because I think it's a, it's a collective responsibility that we all have to serve and support each other. And if I don't take the risk of defining black excellence, even though I'm not black, I think I'm missing the opportunity to also enrich myself. And I'm missing the opportunity to serve my, my community. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I, I don't think we can... Um, abdicate, that's the word I was thinking of abdicate. in my head, abdicate our responsibility to understand what we're trying to get out of the black excellent approach, black excellent plan. You, I think, very articulately kind of said, there's historical connections. Part of the you know, subconscious of this particular country that is dealing with, that we're, we're, which we're trying to kind of remedy. But, you know, as we do this, we have to be able to say, whether I'm Latino, whether I'm white, is that you know, if we agree, if we can agree that the purpose of public education in a very Thomas Jefferson sort of approach is to say we are looking for an educated citizenry that can make decisions on behalf of our community or our country, then, th then we need to have all, everyone educated so they can be thoughtful, they can be critical thinkers. So we can't, have, we can't diminish that approach to some folks and give it to others. Now, there's some irony here, because I've read a little bit of, of, of Thomas Jefferson, and he was a slave owner and all this type of thing. But his words had meaning, probably more than he anticipated about the importance of education and what we're trying to accomplish with it. And so, you know, I think that whether, you know, obviously, by the time I got to a place where I was thoughtful about it, I ended up in a middle-class life. I didn't start out that way. Mm -hmm. My kids, you know, or my parents, you know, help improve themselves during the course of their life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I would never try to say I have a good understanding where if anyone who has, you know, spent most of their lifetime to young adulthood, like in a in high poverty, yeah. that was not my background. It was my parents' background, but not mine. So to the extent, you know, I, I, I'll try to understand it, but I can certainly learn about it. That's my, that's my responsibility and say we don't have to repeat that. Hundred percent. We we don't, and yeah, I do believe that the collective responsibility is in everybody's shoulder, yeah. no matter no matter your ethnicity or your background. And just like you said, a, a city, a educated citizenry. If we're gonna have a neighbor, if we're gonna go to a dentist or a doctor or request services from someone or provide a service to someone, to the degree that everybody is the most competent they can be, then the society will operate better. So yes. I agree. I, I want to go back to the idea of education because okay. I do, I, I want to explore that a little bit more because there, 
the, the, the original question is, if there is something in the educational system that you would like to see changed within your lifetime, what would it be? And you start addressing a little bit about, well, we should maybe focus on education only. And then the other elements like uh, physical education or diet or social services, like those things should be co- uh, in a different department. Right. So other resources can be allocated for that. And then we can measure the effectiveness of that service se- isolated from... Separately, yes. Distinctly from what we're trying to do in the classroom and our connection with the kids and what they learn at this time. I mean, I think I mean, it all comes down to what I become a great believer in how we create coherence in the system. We don't have coherence. We're trying to do 12 things. We really ought to be doing three things, as an example. You know, there's a reason that when we ha- have a telephone number that it's broken up in three segments, area code, and then like three numbers and four numbers, right? Helps us memorize. Uh-huh. Kind of, you know, brain education there. Well, we as organizations typically work better when we have a clear sense of what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And when it's narrow enough where we can see forward progress on it, we can bring your collective responsibility to making those outcomes, you know, come to pass. So that's why I'm, I'm, I I said, you know, what we need to do, we we probably have been trying to do too much in public education. Mm. Yes. And if we could narrow it, we could do our job better. No, uh, no, it's not to say, again, the nature of society does change and evolve. But I do think we can have to come to a place where maybe people who are really trained to be better caretakers for kids ought to have their place. And those who are trained to be teachers can really do their job better. Because right now we're spreading ourselves into doing all these other responsibilities. And I, it, 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 it I know it stresses people out like crazy. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. I've, uh, the reason why I'm really interested on keep exploring this topic is because this morning I filled out DPS sent us a survey. It's called Mi Voz, Tu Voz. Okay. Uh, for every DPS staff member to share their voice, the principals, teachers, parents, everybody. And one of the feedbacks I gave, now you're going to know it was me. <laughs> one of the feedbacks I gave was, uh, one of the questions was about SEL, social, okay. emo- social emotional learning. And the question was, uh, do you feel that uh, as a district or something like that, SEL is a priority in every school? And my answer was, well, this year coming uh, out of the pandemic, the Department of Education mandated the science of reading and this uh, new methodology, which makes sense, is science-based and it makes 100% sense to for us to teach our kids, and we're adopting a new curriculum. So from the top, the very, very top, were sent and expected uh, a big handful of uh, strategies and implementation of curricula that makes SEL as a side hustle. I don't feel, I recognize the importance, especially with our babies and all the trauma that they went through the pandemic. I recognize how foundational it is to have a healthy social emotional learning environment. But systemically, what we're expected to do is focus on the academic development. So SEL, although I recognize as a leader that is foundational, it becomes a side hustle because most of my resources, money, and structures have been allocated to respond to the academic learning. And that takes me to, we are educating and developing the whole child, and that implies the heart, the mind, the health, and everything else. But to what degree is school going to be able to manage all the balls and keep them all in the air? How long are we going to continue doing this until we realize that, hey, this project might not be realistic? Great question. And to answer, the short answer is not that long. You think? I think things will fall, invariably. Um, I have a little bit of cynicism about the science of reading, uh, also, and, and when it comes to the Department of Education, mostly because I took the time to read through all those documents, and I said they're mostly authored by a reading company. So it's it's in service of what they perceive as the right thing, and then they got got adopted by um, the Department of Education, Colorado Department of Education. I wish there was some transparency, even by the Colorado Department of Education, to say, you know, we read this from this company, and we, we tend to believe that's the right thing. So we're going to adopt it. At least say that 
with some transparency. Mm-hmm. Instead, you get it like this is their research. That's it. Yeah, that's it, and, and, and it's gospel. Uh, so be gospel. that as it may. So, so that is. Uh, I'll set that aside for just a second. And he said, "All right." So we have some decisions to make here as leaders. Now, there's an old uh, saying that says, "You know, culture and climate eats strategy for lunch." Right? If people aren't feeling well about themselves, it's not likely they're going to be too attentive to whatever strategy you put in front of them. So social and emotional learning is sort of like how do people in their well-being feel like in their personal sense of readiness to learn? Mm-hmm. If they don't have that, then their readiness to learn is going to be weak. So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what sort of literacy strategies you throw in front of them, they may not be too receptive. Mm-hmm. So that's me saying to you, well, as a school leader, you have to make a decision. The decision might be my investment is going to be, in this case, SEL. You know, as primary... We're not going to ignore literacy. It doesn't go away. But, you know, you want to make sure kids are in a re- good place so they can accept, they can learn, and practice the, the literacy approach. And that's how you have to think these throughs, things through, through, I believe. Now, I think that if we try instructional practices, let's go back to equity, mm-hmm. culturally responsive teaching practices. I, I get confused with all these different labels. <laughs> We're supposed to do that instead of this. I think as professionals, we begin to migrate these things together and pull, and we have to make meaning for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So SEL, not entirely, but part of it is, is relationally oriented. Mm-hmm. How do we build relationships amongst between teacher and, and kids, between kids amongst each other, and so forth? Mm-hmm. I mean, every good teacher does that part, I believe. Yeah. The other component around SEL is like, how do you get sure kids have a chance to have voice? So some it's small group work, some it's like more one on one, and you begin so they begin to gain a sense of competence and respect respect among their peers. Well, I think effective teachers and will do the same thing. Now, in cultural responsive teaching, a lot of times we really ought to be looking how can we build the collective voice of the kids? How do they learn how to work in community? And that's a cultural approach. Mm-hmm. Based on my reading, certainly, you know, a lot of African cultures have that. You bring it up. A lot of Latino, Latin cultures kind of work with a collective approach. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that individuals are snuffed out, but what we have to do is how do we learn to work together, right? So I think we have to begin to pull some of these things together, migrate them or integrate them, however you might say, to get the end outcome. Like in this case, how do we become better readers? We have to start with, I think, these other... So I'm just going to say, I think we might need to start with SEL first. Have a good understanding. How do you incorporate that in in your instruction um, so they can become better readers? And equip our teachers and everybody who serves our kids to be successful with social-emotional learning. Because um, going back to the idea of trying to do many things in the the educational system, teachers have to be psychologists, counselors... Uh, instructional, knowledgeable, instructionally competent enough to help our kids grow. But teachers are continuously being challenged by new uh, problems of practice that go beyond academic learning. When you receive these babies in your room, uh, you have you can have up to 35 of them. Uh, many of them are ready to learn, very well loved, cared, nurtured at home. They come to school to learn. But many of them know. Many of them come to school with, you know, three hours of sleep and uh, maybe a bowl of cereal they ate at 5 p.m. the day before. And uh, so it's, um, I, gr- I agree with you, SEL should be the fundamental, the foundational stone upon which you build everything else. Mm-hmm. But the mm-hmm. expectations, the resources, the money, the curricular resources that come are geared towards academic learning. And, of course, DPS is very intentional. Uh, I mean, the fact that DPS is asking us, give us your voice to see what we can focus on, it tells me that uh, they are definitely open and willing to to listen. But um, I think we're doing too much. That's for sure. I do think so. Um, And and, and not just DPS. I think there's a tendency in in most school districts. So here's my other thing. that If I were to – I used to have a professor who would say – 
if I have commissar of education, he would make some sort of pronouncement, you know. <laughs> so if I were commissar of, ed- of education, I would say, school districts, find what you think is the most important thing to you and do it for at least three years, right? These, you know, every, you know, the, when I was a superintendent, I walked around, I would all my schools, I met regularly with faculty, and here's what they would say. We're doing too many things. I'm not sure what to focus on. So my job was to say, how do we reduce that? How do we abandon things, let go of things? I think that's a, a major thing. What happens is that you get these initiative creep. Start with the science of learning. And then we're going to bring in some new curricula. So now you've got to learn the new curricula, you know, whatever the materials are in the program, along with the science of learning. Then you get something else. Assessment know. platform. A new assessment, assessment platform. Yes. You know, and, and so, you know, I don't know that anyone gets good at anything until like two or three years. The first year, we're, we're just trying to learn it, you know, how it goes. Second year, we kind of know what we didn't know very well, so we get better at it. The third year, we're kind of fluent, given the sports analogy. Um, you know, uh, I play golf, not well, because I haven't been consistent, but I've tried to apply my teacher's head to this, right? Okay. <laughs> so I've had, at this point, many golf lessons, and usually it comes down to work on two or three things. Don't try to work on 10 different things. I could easily try to work on 10. In the middle of a swing, you're only working on two things for me. I try to keep my head in one position, and on my backswing, you know, I'm trying to keep my arm pretty straight so you have a regular, uh, a regular uh, um, form, I guess. I can't think of the right word right now uh, when I strike the ball. Uh-huh. Keep my hand. So if I, if I work on those just two things, now I've been working on those two things for about eight years. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally I'm very successful at it, <laughs> but they require a lot, of, a lot of training. We need to get practiced well enough. So here's another sports example. I'll use golf because I've been following that more recently. There was a time when a gentleman named Tiger Woods was perceived to be, frankly, the world's best golfer current times and you know it's still no i would think so yes arguably maybe i mean he won all these championships you know and he was just he would do extraordinary things uh, you would say so he had it right natural talent obviously and you want to read the research in ten thousand hours he put it in ten thousand hours right he did all but he had like three or four different golf coaches mm. along the way i mean he was still waiting for people to observe him a nuanced sort of way, improve his game. So that's the role of instructional coaches, I think. In a nuanced sort of way, improve the practice of teachers, but not that, you know, radically have to change it every year. That's hard for anyone. You know, I'm going to be a drummer. The next year I'm going to be a piano player. The year after that I'm going to play the flute. I mean, yeah, that's hard. It's too much. Y- you make me think of Peyton Manning. You know, Peyton Manning, the yes, former yes. Bro- Broncos yeah, quarterback. Man, yeah. To me, he's the greatest football player on earth. And that's the only time in my life I watch football. Now I don't even. <laughs> my wife, it's funny. My wife watches football on Sundays, and I am the one who cooks. <laughs> I bring her I bring her, her seltzers for her to drink <laughs> and watch football, and I'm the one making the meal prep for the weeks. We change roles at our house, our traditional roles. Yeah. Peyton Manning used to have... When he was in the Broncos, where he was breaking all those records, yep. he had like four or five coaches. Yes. And some people will only focus on his foot movement when he had the ball after the snap. Other people will focus on his neck and elbow and the upper body positioning. And then they will pull it all together in the tape room, I guess, when they were watching the yeah. video. And he was the best on earth, and he was still taking notes from his coaches. Yeah. But their focus was throwing, you know, like being a quarterback. I think. Applying that analogy to schools, if we have uh, an array of coaches that focus exclusively on instruction, maybe we could improve. But going back to the idea of schools as, I guess, a community hub, Mm -hmm. because that happens here at CMS. My Latino families, when they know my stories, they know my struggles, they come to school to connect with me and my teachers about other things. You know, like, hey, I need my paperwork for my visa or I... I, I wouldn't disclose anything about people being documented or undocumented, but there is a lot of that. And then divorce and then, you know, legal paperwork about who watches who. And then all of a sudden you have this huge tree with a lot of branches that is the whole child mm-hmm. and uh, the academic learning in a 
high poverty, Title I, free and reduced lunch school. Yeah, we of course, we're striving for academic learning, but it, my days go by with many other things. And um, I mean, I mean, if somebody's listening right. to you and agree with the idea of let's focus, but also accountability, right? Like the Department of Human Services or any other departments at the city of Denver are uh, allocating money to serve the community. If they become more accountable for the mental health of our kiddos, and then we are all of a sudden have a deployment of 13, 15 social workers to every school helping, you know, improve an accountability measure that is held accountable by other departments, not the education department. Maybe we can get something going. But if everything goes to the school performance framework. And See, that very good point. And, and so <clears throat> I may have been too simplistic to say we ought to just focus on instruction and those other things need to be taken care of other people. Now, in real life, Teaching and learning is a people business. We form relationships. So when your school is a community hub, I think that's a beautiful thing. It also lends itself to ha providing other types of services. The dilemma, and what I'm trying to reconcile, is the current accountability system doesn't take into account all those other types of services you're providing, which makes for the growth of the community. You're looking at a single, you know, academic measures. CMAS, status, growth, and uh, same with math and literacy, and that's about it. Attendance, usually, you know. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the challenge we have. Because there's simple measures, narrow, really narrow, then we have to ask the question, is that fair? I'll raise the hand. It's not fair, but okay, so I'm not controlling that part. Then the other part would be then, how can I best maximize the skills and talents of my teachers as teachers as opposed to being the social worker or being the daycare keeper and this type of thing. And so that's the challenge that I think we have to juggle as both as an organization and maybe as a society and a community. I do think so. Also backwards planning from the human beings we currently have in our society and if we want something different out of the human beings that we currently have, you know, the the episodes of Anxiety, depression, obesity, or delinquency, or drug abuse, like all those things that we see manifest in our adult population. Yes. How can we establish other ways of behaving or modeling other ways of behaving in our babies? So by virtue of being in this community hub, they grow up to not be like the problems we're trying to solve for. So if what we're currently seeing in our society are academic challenges, people being uneducated, but in addition to that, other issues that diminish the quality of our society, right. then that's when we should be creative and, and think of what else can we do with this population of kiddos so when they grow up, they behave differently. Right. And one of the things that I've been sparring with other principals and other podcasts is the idea of why do we still have to move kids from one grade level to the next based on their birth date? When we see more episodes of compassion, service, when we mix kids when you put fifth graders and kindergartners in the playground, they play way more carefully. They, the big ones are watching after the little ones. There are leadership opportunities for some kids to push the other ones on the swing. And you start seeing that community organically happen in ways that are more authentic. So those kind of things are the ones that are making me wonder, you know, what creative solutions can we put in place to, to mitigate some of those roadblocks that we're having? Well, you know, I don't know that in a large organization that you can change that. I mean, without the whole organization changing. <clears throat> but at the school level, you can introduce those ideas. And maybe they can work. It's not because it's a bad idea. It's really, it's the, it's the scale of it. So uh, I would say, you know, you won't be in first grade until you turn six. So you're six in, let's say you turn six when you're in June, but I turn six when I'm in December. So... You enter first grade in June, I enter in December. At least chronologically, that's more equal mm. than we all are first graders, you know, in September, regardless when we turn to six, right? In fact, I was just reading something from Malcolm Gladwell, kind of revisiting this whole age thing about, you know, kids who are older in first grade, but, or well, kids who are in younger ages, they're older when they enter those particular ages or grades just because they've been born sooner, have an advantage, 
right? If I get born in January, and by the time I get into be a first grader, you know, I have at least six months more of developmental time than the person who was born in July and is six years old and enters, you know, first grade. And so they have, you know, an advantage that way that isn't because they're intrinsically smarter. Life, you know, at a young age, you know, six months is something. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So, so your idea is a good idea. But how do you do kind of the logistics around that? Or how do you have teachers who are, fortunately, we're uh, um, a result of the system that exists. Mm. So we kind of grew up with it. So it's hard for us to break out of that particular particular mental model that is actually where you know i think potentially charter schools or private schools could experiment with that Mm -hmm. now uh, i think private schools actually have a greater opportunity because they can create models that you know people come in with their eyes open knowing that that's the model charter schools sort of but you know charter schools unfortunately have been i think have been bastardized a little bit they're not uniquely different i think than most public schools except you know they just campaign for a population that's more apt to be prepared anyway. Yeah, in my, in my opinion, the main difference between charters and public schools is marketing. Yeah, to be honest with you, I've um, the, the way our populations like, yeah, but th- there this has to be a time for the younger generation of leaders where we feel encouraged to try things out of the box. And be able to to poke and ask questions and trying to see how can we change the system in a way that that is meaningful. And my challenge with this podcast and having conversations with with people that I love and respect like you is going beyond pointing the problem and trying to be challenged to find solutions. And it's hard. It's really hard. It's yeah, hard. I want to keep doing it because uh, the more I talk and the more the more I share the more uh, ideas I get. And I hope this collective wisdom just uh, trickles down to everybody who listens because I think it's time. I think it's definitely time. I mean, the system is working for those who have always benefited from it. And because it still works, they don't feel the need to change it. But for those of us who made it despite of the system, we need to think of how can we just explore other ideas. Well, you're an outlier. Your success. One would not typically say when you were a young child that you would be successful in the United States as a principal with that, you know, all the education you've had leading others. I mean, no one would, could have scripted that. I'm an outlier. You know, so no one has scripted that either. So we have to remind ourselves, even though we found success in the system, we don't know all the different type of compensations that helped us along the way. You know, what, what did we have to do to compensate? And understand that because it wasn't the system; it wasn't designed for us. So we don't need, to, in the spirit of equity, we don't need to have people have to go through all the same obstacles that we did. We should remove them so then we can let the real talent, the real skills, come to fruition. Yeah, I imagine I am proud of who I am and, and of my journey, and you should be beyond proud of yourself, of course. But imagine what we could have become if we didn't have to overcome those. I don't know. Is that maybe a paradox? Maybe we become what we became because of the obstacles we faced. Maybe if we didn't have, I don't know. What I do know for certain is that if we all have better starting conditions, right. we will for sure have a better outcome. So, yes, I agree. This has been a pleasure, man. I really appreciate this conversation well, and all. Thank this you time very much. You. So it's been great. You've made me think and pause. I love that. That's kind of what I like to do. And uh, I'm hoping, as, as I said from the beginning, it adds some value to other folks. I hope so too. And before we wrap this up, I uh, wonder if you have any message for anybody who's listening that's Latino, that's in their first year, maybe a teacher or somebody who is thinking for the first time of taking the leadership pathway. Is there anything that you would like to share? Well, that's a heavy question because uh, I should I should should come to immediately to the tip of my mind. But <laughs> you know, I tell you what, I think uh, here's what I'd like to share. I understand that particularly leaders of color aren't typically the ones first invited into these roles of influence. 
So I want to ask the question, have you ever thought about doing that? And if you haven't, why not? If our mission is to help all our kids be successful, are we better served by a place of influence than not in a place of influence? I argue we're better served by being in a place of influence, and that might be formal leadership, assistant principal, principal, central office, executive director. You know, I've never been an assistant super. Uh, well, I've never been a superintendent. Clearly, I know that. If I didn't have a mentor who said to me, "Ron, someday you're going to be a great superintendent," I had never even thought about that. I thought I had reached my ceiling, and I'm glad he encouraged me because it made me think about what were the obstacles that were preventing me. Fortunately, they were in my head. Right, I put certain obstacles in my head. Now, obviously, I had to compete for it. Now, we got we have to be willing to compete and even fail. Absolutely. Yeah. We will at some point. Well, man, you're a legend. You're very much loved in no, the DPS community. Uh, I certainly appreciate you. I'm grateful for every opportunity you've given me from the Four Corners leadership and your wisdom and guidance on that and all those executive coaching conversations we had before. You had a good uh, answers. I hope we can do this again and maybe dive into a specific topic and, um, and just keep rolling. Let's keep it. Let's keep, let's keep it going. Andale. <laughs> thank you, señor. Right, thank you. That was fun. It was great. Thank you, Pastor. Oh.